I was doing most of the academic work at home, uh, but there were a few things that I saw that I knew my children, different children at different times would be interested in. And so I wanted to give them that opportunity. We, you know, we talked about it and, and then we went with that. But the very first group that I ever joined was just a very large group. I didn't have any idea what I was getting into. I just knew we needed connection. We had just moved into a, a brand new state in a new city and I knew no one. It was my opportunity to make connections with people and it ended up being a marvelous experience. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Demi Learning Show. It's fall here in North Carolina, and my voice has sort of left me, so you're going to have to put up with a little bit of a scratchy voice. Lisa has said the same thing. She's having the same challenge in Florida. We're excited to have a conversation with you about co-op environment learning, and we want to bring a little bit of a different twist to it. We want to talk to you a little bit about some of the Demi Learning products and what you might find an enhancement to a co-op experience. But we also want to talk to you about reading the room and being able to recognize how to get the best out of a co-op experience, how you as a parent might need to know when it's time to change the co-op experience, how you might be able to encourage a reticent child to participate in a co-op experience. And I have brought two of the best here today to have a conversation about that. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Sue, we'll start with you, and then Lisa will continue on. My name is Sue Walker. I have been with Demi and hanging out with parents for since almost the beginning of the of the Matthew Z product. So I just have to say is every time I go into a situation like situation like this, I know I'm going to learn something, and that's that's kind of my theme of of how I work with small groups is is also it's not always about me teaching them it's what can i learn to be better at what i do now i should say as an aside before lisa introduces yourself sue's a bit of a ringer sue is also our professional staff artist and she teaches small group environments all the time but she works with adults now does that mean that's an entirely different enterprise than working with kids no not really not really, because we all have the personality that we bring to the table, and it's up to Sue to figure out how to help those personalities work together. So we're going to let her tell a few stories, because I think you'll be able to fit yourself in the frame of how important it is to be part of that dynamic that is a solution finder. Lisa? Thanks, Gretchen. Yes, my name is Lisa Cimento. I am a placement and support specialist here at Demi Learning. I've been with the company for seven years full time. And before that, I worked um, summers as a contractor at homeschool conventions. And it is a joy to um, meet parents, meet families and um, help support them, just encourage them. And I just love what Sue said. Um, I have learned over time how much I learn from uh, my colleagues and from the parents that we get a chance to speak with all the time. So it's it really is a collaborative effort. And part of the reason I asked Lisa to join us is Lisa's the mother of four. As she says, they're all grown and flown. But she's had she's homeschooled in more than one state. So she's had more than one kind of co-op experience. So she brings an expertise to the table of being able to understand how to enter an established co-op, which can sometimes be a little bit of a scary proposition. Or if you don't find one you like, maybe how to find one that fits or create one that fits. Lisa, uh, one of the things I want you to talk about, and I think I'll begin with this, is um, Stephen's experience in a sports-oriented co-op. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think we all are in the frame of it's all academics, it's all academics, and it's not. No, it definitely isn't. There are so many things, and I know that we're going to hear from Sue later, but there are so many different ways um, that kids can learn in group settings. So um, there was a group uh, in, uh, in a, a group that we were in when we were living in Central Florida, and it was it initially started out as just a sports group, and it allowed homeschool students to play competitive sports against small schools. You know, we weren't gonna be playing against large 
schools or anything like that, but we did play against small um, private schools and uh, some just some smaller, maybe some charter schools that were local in the area, but we played all around our county. And um, so a couple of my kids, Sarah uh, played volleyball and uh, Daniel and Stephen were both runners and they ran cross country. Stephen also ran track and they made it to state championships in Jacksonville one year. It was really really wonderful to give kids that had athletic ability and a, a desire to excel that opportunity to go and uh, compete. That same group, though, then did branch out eventually, and they started offering some academic courses as well as some enrichment courses. And we we had lots of opportunities. My kids took um, some English classes. There were math classes offered. There were history classes. There were um, biblical study classes. So there's lots of different opportunities um, if you look around. And hopefully, wherever you are, if you're interested in teaching or uh, giving your kids that opportunity for a group setting, that you can find groups that do offer a variety of different things. So Lisa, in your experience, you kind of went and looked for the things you were looking for for your kids rather than looked for an experience that sort of filled all the gaps. Yeah, um, I, you know, I was doing most of the academic work at home, uh, but there were a few things that I saw that I knew my children, different children at different times would be interested in. And so I wanted to give them that opportunity. We, you know, we talked about it and, and then we went with that. And in that particular group, that's the way it worked out. The very first group, and I can talk about that more later if you like, but the very first group that I ever joined was just a very large group. I didn't have any idea what I was getting into. I just knew we needed connection. We had just moved into a, a brand new state in a new city and I knew no one. It was my opportunity to make connections with people and it ended up being a marvelous experience. Terrific. I'm really excited to, to imagine that. I didn't have a co-op experience until we'd been homeschooling about six years. And our co-op experience was limited to high school. So we created a couple of co-ops where a bunch of us would get together for a project-oriented adventure. But I never really had the experience of having young kids in co-op. It was my eighth through 12th graders that had that experience. Sue, I want to circle back to you uh, and talk a little bit about what we talked about earlier this morning, because I think you had a wildly valuable insight about different kids in different settings. And so I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about the experience you had last week teaching to the group and some of the insights that you learned from that experience. Yes, it was uh, getting prepared for this um, presentation has been just really I've learned so much just already, just from this. So I was asked to come and speak to a junior high group um, about art. So it was art related. And the first thing I noticed when I walked into the room was there was this huge room with a small group of kids and they didn't have, they could just be anywhere. And so already they're five rows back. There's a big cluster of them. But then the one that really got to me was the the young girl in the front who reminded me of me. She was like, didn't want to look at me, you know, kept going like this type of thing. And it's like, oh my gosh, um, that's me. That's me growing up. And so um, she was just on my heart, but I didn't, I made sure knowing what I would have wanted, I did not like point her out or try to get her to talk or anything like that, because that would be what I would not have wanted now. Um, and then I did contact the teacher later and said, Hey, I, I was that way growing up. Please let me know if I can help in any way, but also that the kids were allowed this large space. And my thought was I'd never had that experience where the room is too big. Like I, I thought if I were to speak there again, I would encourage everybody to come forward. I would not allow that big space where, you know, how kids are, there's who's in, who's out and all that. And I mean, I could tell who's in, who's out just by looking out into the audience. 
Um, so I would have probably found a way to deal with that. It's not mine to deal with, but those are the kind of things. Safe space is real important to me, and it probably has to do with my shyness growing up, but that's real important. But it's not always clear how to make the space safe. You need to look at the environment your kids are in, not just assume because they're rolling into a co-op class that it's what you want it to be, right, Sue? Because right. one of those students didn't have a terrific experience because you, right. like she was sort of on the outside. And so being able to, as a parent, not necessarily to intervene, but to observe and then have a conscious conversation we had the privilege last week of talking to three fantastic co-op directors. And one of the questions I asked them was, how do you make it inclusive? How do you include kids who are um, more reticent to be included? And I think it's up to us as parents a little bit to teach that inclusion, to create an opportunity for the shy child to be included, maybe to find a child to include them. I know I experienced this this morning. I coach swimming and I have 15 freshman swimmers <laughs> and it's going to be quite an adventure this summer, this uh, winter. And two of them are very, very shy. You stand them all in a line and you've got two who are stepped one step back behind the others. And so my immediate thought was to go to those two reticent students and say, who brought you here? Who is your friend? And sort of get them to connect to each other so that they would feel a little bit safer and a little bit more connected. In homeschool environments, we're kind of used to doing our own things. I used to laugh when we would take field trips to the zoo because you always knew when there was a group of homeschool kids, the teachers would have all the classes lined up. They'd all be lined up in different directions. And the homeschool kids are all wandering everywhere. Nobody's in line anywhere, <laughs> which is funny. But it's up to us to create that environment where kids feel included and they feel safe. I wonder, Sue, if you could talk a little bit about, I want to set a scenario. So I want to talk about, I'm a, in a co-op, I'm a mom who's teaching math and I recognize there's some kids in the co-op who have some fundamental deficits in their math skills. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about how maybe pulling them aside and having a conversation with a parent about AIM might be helpful for those kids. Can right. you talk a little bit about that? Right. And the fascinating thing about working with parents with AIM or, or, uh, I've been recently trying to figure out how to get AIM in a co-op setting and make it work. So we're working on that and hopefully we'll have something that could be more of a group setting. But the big thing is, is a lot of times we're so busy looking to see, did they get the work done? We're not looking at the behavior as they get the work done. And the tragic thing is kids can get into uh, even high school and still counting on their fingers to add and subtract. And so this is something um, we were seeing over the years continually happening. And a lot of times they get the work done. You don't realize it like in second and third grade, they can still get the work done and count on their fingers. But as it gets older and more complex, they're not able to. So first of all, I would, if I was a teacher or a parent, I would be looking for evidence that they're counting. And it could be, uh, you know, wiggling their fingers. I mean, they they know they're not supposed to be counting, so they often hide it. So you have to be looking for it. But the cool thing is, is the AIM program is designed for that student, this, the older student who does not, did not get their facts mastered and have developed a habit of counting. At this point, it's a habit. It's how they get it done. Um, it, so it doesn't mean they're not capable. 
And um, a lot of times drill sheets and those types of things are used, but for many, many people, drilling does not go into long-term memory, so it doesn't work. And so the beauty of AIM is it gets it, it takes care of it and gives them more fluency. And you will see their, in general, math scores start soaring. Um, I just had a, a, a tutoring or a school that did a one-on-one -on -one tutoring of AIM um, with a ninth grader and they are just blown away. Like she now has her facts. She's functioning at a whole new level in math. So I can't stress enough the importance of that. However, it would be, it's it's currently better in a tutorial one-on-one -on -one setting. We have not quite figured out how to get in a group setting, but we are working on that. Um, so I can't stress enough, especially in the math, how important that is. And again, those kids are not going to want to be embarrassed to show themselves counting so how do they function or do they just not answer or what do they do um, but to be that's something to be aware of especially if you have a student that is hesitant to give an answer or and isn't otherwise shy or anything um, that it could be that they're still dealing with this absolutely and i one of the things that we as parents have a capacity to do that is rare in any other environment, in a co-op environment. Yes, you know your student, but sometimes you're not always the prophet in their land. So it's important for you to know who the tutor or the instructor or the co-op presenter is so that they'll be able to understand your student as well. And I'm saying this in the context of, I want to teach my children to be accountable to more than just me. But by the same token, I think it's also important if I have a child who's absolutely going to go catatonic, if you call on them in class, it would be in my best interest to let the um, co-op instructor know that ahead of time and maybe create a situation where that student could be comfortable before we called on them. And I think that makes a tremendous amount of difference. Lisa, I want to talk to you a little bit about Right Shop because I know you said you wished Right Shop had been around when you were teaching your kids because the creative writing end of the experience was the part that you found to be difficult. Did you ever have the opportunity to engage in a creative writing experience in a co-op environment? And if not, what would you have looked for because you weren't comfortable with a co-op experience. Yeah, um, when we when we first acquired Right Shop, I I kind of dove in. I wanted to see what was what was going on with this program because I had bopped around to a lot of different kinds of language arts curriculums and things to try to help me figure out how to teach writing better. I knew what good writing looked like when I read it. I just I just didn't have the tools to teach it properly. And I didn't have the proper tools to give my kids constructive feedback the way that they needed. You know, I didn't always know what to say or how to guide them into better writing. Fortunately, because we read such quality literature, they kind of all um, accidentally turned into pretty good writers. <laughs> I was very thankful for that. And so good literature is, is a key for sure. Um, when we got into this one group that did expand into um, academic courses, there was a teacher there who was teaching a grammar course and a creative writing course. And um, Sarah especially really wanted to do that. She is uh, she's my writer and she really uh, looked forward to that. And she got so much out of that class. And I think the reason she got so much out of it was because this teacher not only had the tools to um to teach the writing skills but she knew how to give that constructive feedback and that's one of the things that write shop does so i think that if you are a co-op or um someone who's considering being a teacher in a co-op the write shop course provides those tools for the instructor it equips the tools you know the instructor with those tools to be able to um for, present the skills, teach them, give the kids opportunity to write, 
and at the same time, allowing them to write about the things that interest them, which I think is just golden. Um, and, and then also those tools for constructive feedback. That's a critical one that I think is just so necessary so that you're not just red penning a kid's writing thing and then giving them a grade, but you're giving them opportunities to grow and understand how they can improve the different skills that they can learn to, to tweak their writing in such a way that's going to make it even better. One of the things that I found that I loved about Write Shop, and I never had the opportunity to teach it, but unlike Lisa, who was very comfortable teaching mathematics, I was not. So in a co-op environment, I had to choose what I was comfortable teaching, and that was creative writing. I taught creative writing for 17 years. I love the fact that Write Shop gives you a rubric that, particularly with an older child, that rubric is designed for them to say, did I use complete sentences? Did I vary my sentence structure? Have I punctuated properly? Did I check to see that my spelling was correct? Now, let me just say as an aside, creative writing is the most complex thing we ask a child to do. And it's a little bit on the crazy side, the amount of content we ask them to complete um, when we ask them to uh, do a five paragraph essay because there are so many things, so many skills that they have to bring to the table simultaneously. But I love the way that Write Shop has broken it out and it makes it really super co-op friendly because you can take kids with a variety of skill sets and you can still have a collaborative experience with it. In fact, Write Shop, I think, is probably one of the most brilliantly designed curricula in the fact that it gives you either smaller increments to instruct or more creativity to instruct. And you can tailor within a group of kids who needs what. And isn't that what, that's kind of the alternative definition of a co-op is to be able to do something like that and do it successfully. One of the things I really like about it is that so much of the creative part of writing is done conversationally with Write Shop so that kids aren't being given a blank piece of paper and here, put something down. I mean, that would just give me the hives. But to be able to be that um, facilitator, really, for a group setting, you pull out a big sheet of blank paper and say, let's brainstorm ideas and there are no bad ideas, so just hit me with your best shot and let those kids call out their thoughts and their ideas and put them all down. Everybody's ideas are valid here at this point. And then we'll start narrowing down and then we'll start tailoring and then we'll start, you know, cutting things out that aren't going to be used. But I love that idea of, you know, so that kids aren't stymied, you know, for some kids, the mechanical part is hard and the creative part is easy for people like me and others. The creative part takes so much mental energy that having that blank piece of paper is, is just going to stop the wheels right there. So having that opportunity to just do this conversationally and in a group setting, allowing everybody's ideas to get thrown out, you know, and on that page, I just think it's wonderful. That's awesome. I um, I think now, now see, you have me thinking, ooh, where could I go to have the experience of teaching that again? Like I need something else to do, right? But it would be fun. I think it would be fun. Sue, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about advocacy. Um, I know that you had a different learner in Kyle, and I love, love, love the story of you advocating for him and teaching him to advocate for himself. And advocacy is even more important in a co-op environment because we're working with a variety of different people and they're not the people that sit around our kitchen table every day. So can you Tell a little bit of that story and how you helped him learn to advocate for himself. In college, um, my son was, he'd always struggled in in, in school. Um, learning was hard, but he worked hard. He'd do extra credit. He'd do whatever he had to do to get it done. And he always had test anxiety. So I never stressed out about his test. And so... Um, I remember one day he came home, he goes, they had to take their state testing thing. And, and, um, he said, mom, he goes, I, um, didn't know all the answers. 
So I just guessed and I got done with everybody else. I said, awesome. Good job. Okay. And when he, we would get the results back, he'd hand me the results. I said, looks like you're doing great. Yes, I would take note of where he was struggling, oh. um, but he just needed a lot of encouragement. <clears throat> and he was already advocating for himself. He was already willing to do extra credit. Or, so that was just part of his personality. But when he went to college, he um, he was failing the first college he went to. And his professor said, you know, you really need, because test anxiety, he would go and help all the other kids get it, you know, in study group, get an A on their test. But then he would flunk it because of the anxiety. And so... The instructor said, you need to go get a neural eval so that you can get accommodations. And I just want to make sure those of you with struggling students out there know there are colleges out there that do amazing things with accommodations. So uh, the main thing is, is my number one job with him was to keep believing in him. And he has um, graduated from college. And he struggled in math, but he's an engineer for the Department of Transportation. So I'm just saying, don't limit them by their struggles. And um, back in those days, we weren't big on go getting them evaluated. But these days, get that neural eval if they're having trouble. And the beauty of it, the neural eval was when the, um, the, the doctor said, okay, here's your list and I'm saying list of ways that that um I mean he had OCD he had it all he had it all he says now go get that first degree don't let this limit you this just tells you how you learn and and that's the important thing is especially the beauty of homeschooling you can do a, figure out the way they learn and help them get an education and even in a if you're with the students enough in it because i have taught kids too and i've done art camps and that type of thing is to i really pay attention to the students how they learn how they where they struggle to learn all of that and um i mean it's not easy and you've got to be real observant but you can accommodate a lot of kids in, in a space. I think that, you know, I think that's always a valuable conversation. What I love that Sue brings to the table is the opportunity to be able to look back and say, this was successful. And that's what we all want for our kids is we ultimately want them to be successful. Lisa, I want to talk to you for a minute about how a co-op experience might have been valuable for you because you had a child who thought entirely differently than you did. And so I wonder if you might tell this story a little bit about Sarah and how the you guys saw the world so differently. And <laughs> this is where I think having a co-op experience is in, unbelievably valuable. Yeah, it was tremendously helpful for her to have other people teaching her certain things. Um, I loved being my kids, you know, homeschool teacher, but there were certain things, especially um, for my daughter, because we do, it's like we speak two different languages sometimes. And it took me, it took me way too long to figure it out. Um, eventually I got to that place where I realized I'm saying things and she's hearing something else. So I, I started to ask that question. What did you hear me say? And then what would come back would be something entirely different. And and I've realized her, her mind is kind of marvelous. She is a gifted um, writer and a gifted artist. And she her brain is going much faster than mine. I'm extremely linear. She's crazy random. And um, I would say something she would hear those words and take four steps forward in a direction sometimes that I didn't intend. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that's where some of that miscommunication really went on. But she was, she her her brain was going so much faster than what I had understood. And, you know, um, it it was really a helpful thing for me to have that co-op for those courses where I knew she was going to really love 
the material, love the content, love what she was learning, and she would be able to hear it from someone that she could understand. So she did take the writing courses there, and, and I was so thankful there was an artist who was teaching art classes um, because if, first of all, I'm not an artist, but if I were to attempt to teach art classes, it would be very structured. It would be very linear. These are the mechanics of it because that's me. And that's not the way she needed to learn. This guy was fabulous. He, he really challenged her. And when she would kind of tighten up because she felt like maybe she wasn't doing something wrong, he would um, almost scold her. He would say, you're not taking chances. I need you to take chances, get rid of that. And I want you to go out there and throw stuff on that paper and get the paint on there and do something interesting with it and just enjoy it. And my goodness, it just opened the world for her. And that's the way she paints and draws and, and everything else now. Um, her room looks like a museum, but <laughs> you know, it's just, this is who my daughter is. And I needed somebody who spoke her language to be able to share those things with her and help her grow in her skills and her uh, proficiency in those things in a way that she could receive and understand and really excel. So if you have that child that maybe you find yourself butting heads sometimes, you're not speaking the same language, you have that opportunity as a homeschooling parent to find other people who speak their language that they can receive from and can grow and excel in in those areas that they have aptitude or a desire to learn. Think for me what you would like to leave parents with as far as participating in a group experience and what you would like them to think about for their own students as far as um, going forward into maybe some of the things they might want to look for in an, a group environment that might be an inviting one. Um, we're screaming up on the holidays here. It's the first week of November and um, co-ops are gonna start placing kids in January. So what are some of the things that you would recommend a parent to look for to figure out that they've got the right place to be? Lisa. Um, well, I, I think the communication between the adults involved in the, the group and the parent is, is a key thing. Um, I also want to explore, you know, when we talked last week, we, we, we brought up some ideas that I think were marvelous. And I don't want to steal Sue's thunder on this because she, she, you used this word, Sue, that just captivated me. And you talked about exploring wonder um, and that opportunity for group um, leaders or teachers in a co-op class to allow kids to uh, explore and wonder about things without that um, oppression of, I'm afraid to say what I think the answer is because it might be wrong and then I'm gonna be embarrassed. And one way to explore that, and you know, this, this can be done by parents at home, if you're teaching one child, multiple children, or if you've got a co-op class that you're thinking about, even in something as typically structured as math, you can play the part of the student. Um, in, a, in a recent um, webinar that we did, Gretchen, I talked about that idea of, you know, one thing that homeschoolers tend to miss out on is being called to the board, right, to work a problem out in front of everyone. That can be a humiliating experience for a lot of kids, but, but there's a value in it because there's expression going on. It's not just receptive learning, they are expressing and there, there's so much more that happens that way. Well, what if the teacher goes up to the board and the teacher says, I'm gonna work this problem and I want you guys to lead me. I don't know what, what's next. What do I have to do next? And allow those kids to think it through and start calling out what they think should be the next answer. And then let the teacher do it. Let the teacher make purposeful mistakes and ask the kids, what did I do wrong here? I went wrong somewhere. And what, what's happening there is that they're all getting their brains working. They're all contributing. They're thinking and wondering, you know, and exploring different ways to approach a math problem. And they're, they're having that opportunity to learn that a mistake is not the end of the world. 
you are going to make mistakes. And this gives the teacher, whether it's a parent at home or a co-op teacher, that opportunity to reframe error as opportunities, right? For better learning and better understanding and, and long-term retention. And so I just, I, I love that conversation we had. I don't know if it answers your question here, but I didn't want to let the, the time run out without throwing it out there because I just loved the idea of putting that teacher into the place of a student, let the students give that opportunity to teach themselves and um, by, by offering those uh, different answers. And I think it's going to make the class collaboration much more um, cohesive. People will be working together instead of being afraid of being laughed at by somebody else. This was so valuable. You said, um, I wonder if it would work if, and so get help us help a parent, particularly a linear parent, see a scenario where you would pose that. Um, Lisa's given us a great math scenario. Where's another scenario you might be able to propose that for us? Well, of course, art. Um no risk, no masterpiece is what I always say. Um, because in the reality is, study the masters. They all took risks. They all thought outside the box. And um, even with math, there's more than one way to do it. So you would say, I wonder if, anybody have any ideas? I wonder if there's a different way we could do this. Think of something crazy. It doesn't have to be a fast way. It doesn't. How else could we? How else could we? And then say, so which way would you go? This one that took us a long time, you know? So don't tell them what they can and can't do, but wonder um, and be a safe place to wonder. And, and you might even say, okay, we're going to wonder and we're going to do some crazy stuff. So come up with some crazy answers that don't even make sense. But, you know, that type of thing where it's a safe place to wonder and make mistakes. I don't have to worry in my classes that I could, I don't have to fake a mistake. If I'm truly wondering and if I'm truly being authentic, I'm going to make mistakes. Um, and, and it's just a great opportunity to say, oh, there it is. Oh my goodness. That was such a great mistake because now I'll remember you know, I, I remember more from my mistakes than trying to pound in information and memorize. I remember where I messed up and why I messed up and, and be calm about it. Because the minute you beat yourself up, you won't remember the mistake. You won't use it in a healthy way. And I think perhaps in these last two or three minutes, we have perhaps hit on the most important part of the whole conversation. And, you know, sometimes, depending on how we were parented, it's difficult for us to look at a mistake as an affirmative. Um, I uh, um, think of the anacronym, ac what is that word? Acronym. I can say it. I think of the acronym of FAIL as a first attempt in learning. Um, and I think that that's really important. But we have to be willing as parents to make mistakes in front of our children in order to give them permission to make mistakes so that we can break that cycle of perfectionism. And, you know, I had a had the opportunity a year ago to have a wonderful conversation with one of our coworkers, Amanda Capps, talking about the, the myth of perfectionism and how we need to kind of walk that back a little bit. We'll put that in the show notes for those of you who are uh, still interested in doing a little bit more research. I think that was a really valuable conversation. And I think it's important, Gretchen, that we don't say when I talk about learning to make mis it's been a process for me as well. It's not easy to become a lover of making mistakes and taking risks. It has to be intentional and it, it has to kind of grow on you, to be honest. I think, I think you have to be willing to sit with the those first mistakes and not beat yourself up and feel that different emotion to be able to replicate that again. And sometimes that's a scary proposition to do. It's a particularly scary proposition to do for homeschool moms because, you know, 
this is the longest game you'll ever play as far as investing time and not knowing what the outcomes will be. So it's a tough proposition. Ladies, you can, for our audience today, you all can see why I chose these two ladies to have this conversation. It was a very profitable one, I believe. I want to thank you all for trusting us to come into your living room this week and have this conversation. I hope you've learned some valuable things and we'll look forward to having you all join us again in future conversations. Ladies, thank you all so much for the time that we spent together today. I appreciate you both more than you know. Thanks again for joining us. We're glad to be a part of your educational community. You can help us grow our community even more by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show wherever you may be hearing this. Don't forget that you can access the show notes and watch a recording at demilearning.com forward slash show or on our YouTube channel. We'll see you again next time. Until then, keep building strong foundations for lifelong learning.